Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Hat Gaming Man here, everyone's favourite mustachioed console connoisseur. Being the hardware historian that I am, I am constantly on a quest for new information regarding my favourite gaming subject. Recently, while surfing on the information superhighway, I came across an amazing video all about a fout Canadian console. This fantastic video is deep, in-depth and full of information which most of us are completely unfamiliar with. So, rather than letting this video sit in a position of obscurity with only 1,000 views, why not feature it here? so that it can potentially reach the audience it deserves. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to leave you in the capable hands of James from Stuff We Play. This is the story of the Game Wave, Canada's own console. Yeah. Has everybody got a remote? Oh, awesome, green matches my shirt. <laughs> hey Mike, is that your DVD player? No, no, that's the Game Wave, but it also plays movies. In 2005, a small company in Mississauga, Ontario, released a video game console that they hope would carve out a new corner of the video game industry. This was Zappit Games' Game Wave Family Entertainment System. Initially, the future seemed bright for Zappit and their console, Funding was plentiful and much research and development was handled by companies such as National Semiconductor and Panasonic, while the console itself was designed by renowned Ontario firm Nitric Limited. With a $100 price tag and the ability to play DVDs, this system was poised not as a major contender in the video game console market, but rather as an affordable multimedia center that was perfect for families. But the Game Wave would not make waves with consumers. It was quietly discontinued in 2009 with only 13 games released for it, seeming destined to fade into obscurity. But then, a few years later in 2013, Zappit's former CEO, Hari Venkatacharya, would have a warrant issued for his arrest for committing millions of dollars worth of fraud in Canada, the US, and India. Crimes that, according to some former Zappit employees, were committed before during and after his tenure at the company. So what happened? This is a story of dreams and a desire to change an industry. This is also a story of greed, exploitation, and corruption. This is not just a story of the only video game console to come from Canada, but those who made it and how they all but faded into obscurity. This is the art of failure. In 2003, a small group of businessmen came together outside of Toronto. Led by one Richard Fast, their goal would be to market and sell a video game console. This would be the Game Wave. In 2003, the video game market was dominated by three main companies. Sony with the PlayStation 2, Nintendo with the GameCube, and Microsoft with the first generation Xbox. For a small Canadian company to compete with these industry titans would be insanity, and those at Zappit knew it. So, they aimed to not compete with them at all. The Game Wave aimed to be two things. First off, instead of being aimed at traditional gamers, it was aimed at families. It was to feature games that focused on being played together in a relaxed setting, and from the outset was planned to easily connect with four and later six controllers at once. To be accessible to as many families as possible, Zappin aimed to have the Game Wave cost only $50 CAD. Secondly, it was meant to be a pseudo-successor to a line of gaming-capable DVD players known as Nuon, which in itself were pseudo-successors to the 3DO consoles of the mid-1990s. The idea behind a 3DO, brainchild of EA founder Trip Hawkins, and later the Nuon, was to make gaming transition from a medium involving dedicated consoles created by individual game companies to instead feature a standard of game console technology that would then be licensed out to various manufacturers, much in the same way as with CD players, VCRs, and DVD players. 
The 3DO model was to use an actual console architecture which would be updated every few years, with the consoles themselves being manufactured by companies initially such as Panasonic, Goldstar, and Sanyo. However, the 3DO systems would ultimately fail. The reason why game consoles made by individual companies are typically successful is because they are sold at such a low price that the companies behind them take a bit of a loss, but then that money is recouped through the sale of software. But as the individual console manufacturers in the case of the 3DO would not be making money off software, just hardware, some 3DO models upon release in 1993 wound up costing as much as 700 US dollars, the equivalent of over $1200 today. The Nuon then took a slightly different approach. Instead of being CD-based game consoles, these would just be DVD players that had the ability to play games as well. Originally unveiled as Project X in 1999, the first Nuon DVD player would be released in 2001. However, despite much hype and with new incompatible DVD players being released by the likes of Samsung and Toshiba, these would ultimately be canned in 2003 with only 8 games released for the platform. Those at Zappit took a good look at the failures of 3DO and Nuon. What had caused these failures? Was it truly just hardware costs? Was it a lack of marketing? Or they ultimately thought, had their predecessors targeted the wrong market altogether? The Game Wave was going to be more than just a game console. It was going to be a low-cost home entertainment machine, capable of playing both games and DVDs, and it was going to be marketed towards families, not gamers. Most importantly, Zappit would not be going into this endeavor alone. Richard Fast and those with him would reach out to business contacts both in Canada and abroad. They did not have the capabilities to make the Game Wave themselves, but they knew many who could help. Ultimately, they would partner with and gain research and development assistance from American semiconductor manufacturing giant National Semiconductor, consumer electronics firm Macrovision, chip manufacturer Altera, and Japanese electronics giant Panasonic. The design of the console itself would also be farmed out to award-winning product R&D firm Nitric Limited, which along with having a great reputation, had the added bonus of being located only a few minutes away from Zappit's offices. The console would go through several vastly different design concepts during development. Some of these would essentially be the new one, as in DVD players that could just happen to play games. Others would be Windows CE based machines, with some apparently going so far as to be fairly similar in design to the Sega Dreamcast console, though due to licensing costs, these were ultimately scrapped pretty quickly. According to John Clark, who is in charge of the hardware design team at Nitric, We originally started looking at all types of media processors. Some of the challenges were that we needed a very low-cost media processor that could do MPEG playback, yet still had enough resources that would allow us to program the games. What they ultimately decided on was a design based around a national semiconductor Media Maddox processor. Nitric would then deliver the first GameWay prototype to Zappit in October 2004. And from there, things would commence smoothly for a bit. The Game Wave, formerly known at release as the Game Wave Family Entertainment System, was set to be released in 2005, and there are no real bumps in that plan, save for manufacturing costs ultimately raising the launch price for the system to 100 Canadian dollars. But those at Zappit didn't see that as much of an issue. When they received Nitric's final design for the console, they were impressed. The Game Wave was designed to look like a literal wave. Featuring a case partially made of real metal, the console itself came in two parts. The unit itself, plus a clear storage case that could hold up to six wireless controllers. When put together, it appeared like a chrome sine wave that, for 2005, a year dominated by designs such as the Motorola Razr and iPod Color, looked absolutely incredible. The Game Wave was sleek and modern looking and would for sure stand out on a store shelf. What would also aid in this would be a line of games, jointly developed by Zappit and Nitric, along with the release of an easy-to-use Zappit SDK, which in theory would allow new tiles to be made for the system with ease. As far as Richard Fast and company were concerned, the millions that had been poured into the Game Wave project had resulted in a console that would be an easy bestseller. And thus, in October 2005, the Game Wave was rolled out in Canada at Toys R Us and Mastermind Toy Stores, with units also available for rental at some Canadian blockbuster locations. 
Each system came bundled with four controllers and a copy of Four Degrees, The Arc of Trivia Volume 1, a simple trivia game that was touted as being able to be picked up and played by almost anyone. In addition, an American rollout was set for early 2006, but there's something incredibly eerie about examining the Game Wave launch. There is little to no promotion for it, no real ads, no evidence of any review units being sent out. What, what were they waiting for? Was Zappit waiting for one of their development partners such as Panasonic to make and market their own Game Wave system? Were they hoping for it to take off based off of word of mouth alone? Or was it something completely different? Perhaps it was a lack of organization. Apparently packaging design for the Game Wave wasn't even decided on until a few months before release. In mid-2005, shortly before launch, Zappit would hire three new employees, all in producer roles at the company, and oddly enough, these three newcomers were the only people at Zappit with prior experience in the video game industry. One of these was associate producer Justin Kwok, who worked on designing games and packaging, programming, and even aiding in promotion. According to Kwok, there were issues in both communication at the company along with the console's hardware itself. I was not aware of the Game Wave when I first joined the company. A former colleague of mine had been hired to take on a senior role there and discovered that he needed some more backing to help with the game side of the product. He got me on board a few months later after he joined the company. There were only three of us there with prior video game industry experience and we all had worked together previously. By the time I joined there were a handful of games, five I think, and we doubled the number while I was there. The library of titles was really good, but ultimately the hardware wasn't the best. It was basically just a DVD with a slightly better processor that could interpret some scripting. Not what I would consider a console. Indeed, the Game Wave was extremely lacking compared to other machines on the market at the time. Barely a month after the Game Wave saw release in Canada, the Xbox 360 would be released by Microsoft which would be enough of a leap in power to be considered by many in the gaming industry as the start of a new generation of console gaming. The Game Wave, in comparison, was based around a Mediumatic's 8611 processor, a processor built with high-quality multimedia playback in mind, not gaming. To many, the Game Wave appeared as less of a game console and more so just a glorified DVD player that could play basic puzzle games. To quote former Zappa employee Mike Montanaro, the concept was viable, but I knew it would never be a major console. As the months went by, the Game Wave continued to fail to catch on. Slow uptake is one thing, but in the case of Zappit, there appeared to be almost no uptake. A few months after launch, Zappit did open up their online storefront, but even though they included a link to the US Toys R Us site on the official Game Wave webpage, there's no proof that the Game Wave ever saw a release in store at any major US retailer. The Game Wave was well through its first year, but seemed like it was destined to crash and burn before it could even get off the ground. Zappit Games needed help, and they needed it fast. It would take a miracle to turn things around. I know that I'm in between uh, dinner, so I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I really wanted to thank each and every one of you for supporting the Time Mandate, supporting Time Quest, and really wholeheartedly promoting Entrepreneur from in this province. This is Hari Venkatacharya, wildly successful businessman and member of the Toronto social elite. Born in Canada as the son of a renowned Indian scholar, Venkatacharya excelled in his studies and, as a young man, found his way into the world of Toronto businessmen. In the late 1990s, he became one of the founders of the IT security firm Karthika, which he soon after helped get acquired by an even larger firm. He was known to be a shrewd businessman who possessed both a powerful bark and bite, and yet he was also considered a valuable and beloved part of his community. In the mid-2000s, Venkatacharya would find himself on the boards of organizations such as Ontario Science Centre, the Royal Ontario Museum, and the Mississauga Halton Local Health Integration Network. He could often be found at events with his wife, dance choreographer and Order of Canada recipient Lada Pada, where they were both described by most who met them as extremely amicable. Perhaps most importantly for this story, Hari Venkatacharya had keen interest in working with Toronto area companies and even arranging multi-million dollar loans for them. He had been following the game wave intently, or so he said, and so around this time, through his many connections and use of his established reputation, he managed to become not only an advisor at Nitric Limited, but also CEO of Zappit Games. With this new leadership in place, it seemed like things would finally turn around for the game wave. 
By this time, the team at Zappit had changed quite a bit since the console launch. Many had come and gone, and indeed, even Justin Kwok was about to leave the company. In his few years there, he had grown the GameWave library from a paltry 5 titles to 11, but that was nothing compared to the libraries of other game consoles in the market such as the PlayStation 2, which boasted libraries of thousands of games. Even if they weren't directly competing with those consoles, those at Zappit knew that a game console was nothing without its library. Of 11 titles out at this time, all of them were made by Zappit and Nitric, and zero of them were from third parties. Further compounding these issues was the fact that the Game Wave technology was very unimpressive, even at its low price, and DVD players and older DVD capable game consoles were quickly falling in price. New ideas were floated by those at Zappa on how to at the very least breathe some life into the Game Wave brand, even if it meant sacrificing the console itself. According to Quark, some of these ideas included porting the Game Wave titles to existing platforms such as the PlayStation 2. Our team was pushing to release games on established consoles instead, and we would have either beaten the market or have been direct competitors with the Buzz game series, which went on to sell over 10 million copies. The company Zappit was committed to making a console targeted to the board game market, so I would say that I had a lot of confidence in the software, but very little in the hardware. Others though weren't so keen to give up on the console yet. Supposedly on Ben Kadacharya's suggestion, it was decided to do a soft relaunch of the Game Wave this time pushing it further to online media outlets and slashing the price slightly, going from $100 to $80. GameWave units finally made their way into the hands of those in the press, and despite its underwhelming specs, many did find it quite charming. Richard Ness of Embedded.com would say of the GameWave, With so much attention focused on the PlayStation and Wii game systems these days, Zappit was able to come under the radar with a game box that's more suited for the whole family than just the younger generation. The Game Wave is like Trivial Pursuit on steroids, with a DVD player thrown in for fun. Indeed, even those in edutainment quite enjoyed the system, with it being stayed in a mid-2006 issue of the Children's Technology Review. Board games come to your TV with this souped-up DVD player designed to simultaneously receive signals from as many as six remotes, so now every member of the family has an equal chance to win points, such as guessing the name of a famous prison in the Hudson, Sing Sing, or the name of the guy who co-invented calculus, Isaac Newton. Yet, even with this newfound coverage, the Game Wave was not picking up in sales and Zappit was still having its team rapidly fluctuate. There were several trains of thoughts at the company on how to proceed without ditching the console itself. One was to shift out of the home market altogether, instead market the Game Wave towards restaurants, who could install it in their venues where patrons could play the various games while they waited for the food, similar to the NTN systems and their Trivial Pursuit-like games that are found at many bars and restaurant chains across North America. The other, however, was to focus even harder at the family entertainment market and specifically target a group that seemed to be ignored by the gaming industry. Christian families, particularly in the United States Bible Belt. When approached about either of these ideas, Venkatacharya was apparently ambivalent to both. However, Richard Fast, one of Zappit's founders, apparently felt that the Bible Belt option was worth pursuing more, though the restaurant system idea would still be worth pursuing, but for now just as a side project. The first order of business towards rebranding the Game Wave as a Christian edutainment system was the quick release of a new version of the Four Degrees Packin' game. Shortly after the original release of the Game Wave system and with it Four Degrees Volume 1, a Volume 2 hit store shelves as well. Now, hardly a year after that, there is Four Degrees, the Ark of Trivia, Bible Edition. Around this time, there is a good deal of coverage in the news about Jack Thompson, an anti-video game activist and Florida attorney who claimed video games promoted sex and violence in youth, going so far as to claim that violent video games promoted school shootings. Despite drawing much ire from many due to his statements and being disbarred permanently from the Supreme Court of Florida in 2008 due to inappropriate conduct, such as making false statements during hearings, at the time many in the Christian right in the US did agree with Thompson and his views. As such, several at Zappit felt that they could poise the Game Wave as a more wholesome alternative to the more expensive consoles. Then, they could sell it directly to this audience at retailers such as Lifeway Christian stores. Perhaps the icing on the metaphorical cake here would be the introduction of the first, and ultimately only, licensed Game Wave game. This would be VeggieTales Veg Out Family Tournament. VeggieTales, with its highly popular cartoon series aimed at Christian youth, seemed like a natural fit here. 
Negotiations, which took place sometime around early 2007, went smoothly and the game would even time with the upcoming 2008 VeggieTales God Made You Special live tour. In addition, VeggieTales official outlets would promote the GameWave, and they would even start carrying GameWave products on their official online store. Set to release in December 2007, VeggieTales Veg Out Family Tournament would be a bit more complex than any other game on the GameWave. It would be less of a basic puzzle or trivia game and be more inspired by the likes of Mario Party. It even was given a dedicated press release. Zappit Games was clearly proud of this title, going so far as to replace 4 Degrees Volume 1 with it as a new pack-in title for the Game Wave. Things were looking like they were finally about to go well for Zappit Games. The new licensed packing game would be a great way to entice their new target audience, while several Ontario restaurants were expressing interest in bringing in Game Waves as a cheaper alternative to NTN systems, assuming of course that Zappit would begin to actually make Game Waves with that in mind. But along with this, as 2008 approached, new smart devices such as the iPhone were preparing to enter the market, presenting a potential new marketplace for their games. Zappit Games seemed to be on the brink of something good, and the VeggieTales game seemed to be the title that would help them reach that. It is rather odd then, that this would be the last completely original title to be ever published by Zappit. $25 million. That's how much had been invested into Zappit Games by 2009, and by then, it was almost all gone. Early that year, Zappit Games would release their first mobile game, a port of 4 Degrees Volume 1 for both iPhones and Blackberry devices, but that would ultimately be their only mobile title. Zappit had decided against entering the restaurant entertainment business as well, even though the Game Wave had failed to catch on with Christian audiences, even with the help of VeggieTales. Harry Venkatacharya had promised to change Zappit Games and Nitric. He'd promised big things and had allowed for the company to completely refocus the console and even their game development plans as a whole, but none of this had really been his doing. According to Anthony Gusson, who's director of business development at Nitric, Soon after we engaged him as a consultant, he gave himself the title of managing director. He was never managing director, and ultimately he produced nothing for us. We had an amicable parting of ways in 2009 or 2010. Despite Venkatacharya's seemingly great reputation among business people in the Toronto area, he had done surprisingly little at Nitric and Zappit, besides greenlighting a few things and issuing some loans. No new games were released after VeggieTales for the Game Wave, though that was not for lack of trying. It was pretty obvious by 2008 that the Game Wave was not going to be a big thing, but it still seemed like a lovable underdog to the talented programmers and designers who'd worked on it. Mike Montanaro said at the time, It was a pet project as I saw the potential for alternative sales channels. I had been successful in alternative channels with CPG goods in the past and wanted to see how far I could take this with them. Seemed like fun. Plus, the team was a bunch of good guys looking to do something different. I like that kind of stuff. This job was not about the money. Most of the stuff I did for them, I never billed them for. Shortly after Venkatacharya's departure, Zappit's funding dried up. The few stores that stocked the Game Wave stopped carrying it, and indeed, some even wound up sitting in warehouses in the US, destined to eventually be sold off as new old stock nearly a decade later. The writing was on the wall for Zappit Games. Despite having much funding pumped into them, they had never had enough funds or direction for a proper ad campaign or the killer app that any successful game platform desperately needs. Around 2010, the company quietly shut down, with those left going to find new, likely higher paying jobs, assuming that they hadn't done so already. The Game Wave website would go offline in 2011, and from there, it seemed that instead of ushering a new type of game console, Zappic Games and their Canadian-developed game system were truly destined to fade into obscurity. But then, in 2013, something odd happened. An arrest warrant was issued for Ahari Venkatacharya. The charge? Committing millions of dollars worth of fraud. Before and during his tenure as CEO of Zappit Games, Venkatacharya was known to lend money to businesses, and indeed even make out loans to companies he was involved with. Often, these would have a handling fee attached to them, which could often cost thousands of dollars. However, after leaving Zappit Games and Nitric Limited in 2009, Venkatacharya's interests shifted towards what he called big business, 
He claimed to have become connected to a funding group in Dubai with connections to the royal family of the United Arab Emirates, and apparently they would be willing to give loans of up to $250 million to promising companies and projects in North America. Though many may find this shady just hearing about it, Venkatacharya had an established reputation as a trustworthy businessman. With these new massive loans came something called a due diligence fee. In one example, in May 2011, an entrepreneur named Anthony Paolucci was seeking to build a series of soccer fields north of Toronto and turned to Venkatacharya for funding. Upon being informed that he could be granted a $235 million loan for his project from the mysterious Middle Eastern funding group, Venkatacharya instructed Paolucci that, in order for everything to go through, he would have to wire him a due diligence fee of over $77,000. Paolucci agreed, and then waited. Weeks and weeks would go by. Paolucci and Venkatacharya communicated frequently by email, with Venkatacharya reassuring him that the loan would arrive sometime soon. But then, in July 2011, Paolucci received an email from Venkatacharya stating that the mysterious funding group had decided not to fund any projects for the next six months, and that, as a result, he would be receiving a refund on his due diligence fee in the upcoming weeks it never arrived. Paolucci was not alone. A fraud investigation was started by the Fraud Bureau of the Peel Region Police, and it was discovered that Venkatacharya had defrauded over 40 companies worldwide, 25 of which were in the Toronto area alone. It's confirmed that he made away with over $3 million, though that amount is potentially higher. And worst of all, for those at Zappet Games and Nitric Limited, some of these fraudulent dealings were in the works while he was at those companies. In 2013, a warrant was issued for Venkatacharya's arrest. He received a prison sentence in Ontario that following year. As for the Game Wave, it may not have sold well and may be but a footnote in gaming history, but those behind it did truly want to try something different, even if what that different was ended up changing a few times and led to them being taken on a wild ride in the process. However, success or not, to this day, the Game Wave remains the only true game console to have ever come from Canada. The Game Wave is a console that was intended to do something different. And it did, even if it didn't succeed at doing so. To put it lightly, the Game Wave failed to make waves. But I've seen some pin the failure of the Game Wave purely on the fraudulent actions of Hari Venkacharya, and how those tainted the reputation of this in recent years. But is it truly all his fault? Did Zappa Games merely just target an audience or audiences that had no interest in video games? Or is it something else? That's for you to decide. This is the art of failure.